Media recognition from Bloomberg, Reuters, recycling trade publications, patented process for 100% recovery of critical metals, including cobalt, lithium, nickel, manganese, aluminum. American Manganese is focused on recycling lithium-ion batteries for electric vehicles. American Manganese trades on the TSX Venture, AMY, the US, AMYZF, and Frankfurt 2AM. For more information, visit AmericanManganeseInc.com or phone me, Larry Ray, at 778-574-4444. Welcome to the Goddard Report. Comments made on the Goddard Report and TalkDigitalNetwork.com are an expression of opinion only. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is Jordan Bateman, Vice President of Communications and Marketing for the Independent Contractors and Business Association in British Columbia. His website, icba.ca. Welcome back to the show, Jordan. Thanks for having me, Jim. Jordan, uh, there's a survey done of Canada's uh, construction companies. What was the report called and what did it find? Yeah, there's a, a group called Construct Connect. Uh, they publish the Journal of Commerce and, and uh, various other publications. And they do uh, statistical deep dives into various trends in the construction industry, uh, a lot of times uh, in the United States. But they've come out with one on the cost of Canadian construction materials, uh, year over year, taking some uh, price index information from Statistics Canada. And let me tell you, um, <laughs> you you've heard a lot about uh, people uh, opening barns and finding uh, plywood and lumber and thinking to themselves, well, I can sell this off and retire. Uh, th the joke is proving to be a little bit true. The, uh, the cost of software lumber has jumped 170% in the 12 months from April 2020 to April 2021. And that's just one of a series of big uh, increases in construction material costs. Now, the price that's listed for lumber ha has come down quite a bit, but it's still, you know, 50% higher than it was a year ago. And whenever there's been a huge spike and then a drop, usually it's followed by a bounce. It'll go back up again. Uh, yeah, that generally happens. Uh, we're very curious to see where we're going to be at. Um, these stats uh, run April to April, which may be the uh, kind of the worst case number for softwood lumber, uh, given the fact that obviously April 2020, a lot of the uh, content was still locked down in COVID. And then April 2021, you saw uh, as high a price uh, for lumber as uh, we'd ever seen. So um, it's slightly inflated by that. But, um, you know, even from January 2021 to April 2021, uh, the cost of lumber went up by a third. So it was uh, <laughs> it's an expensive thing, and not surprisingly, you'll see construction sites, uh, they've brought on uh, security uh, personnel folks to keep an eye. It used to be you keep an eye on your tools or your copper wiring or whatever. Now they're keeping an eye on the lumber. What's this going to do to housing prices? Well, nothing good. Um, it'll just continue to drive them upwards. So, you know, softwood lumber up 170%, uh, veneer and plywood up 126%, um, you know, diesel, so the fuel you need to move uh, equipment around, up 63% in a year. Uh, even waste scrap, iron and steel metal up 60%, uh, electric wire and cabling's up 43%. So all of these costs uh, drive up, um, you know, everything to do with building a house. Like, you know, even even things like metal windows and doors, up 11%. You know, 11% doesn't sound like much in the context of these other numbers, but it's another added expense for the project owner and, and eventually the uh, the people who will live in that in that condo or that home. And, yeah, um, nothing, there's no easy solutions when it comes to housing affordability. And uh, certainly construction materials continues to drive the price as well. What's going to happen to companies who uh, bid on projects and said they would cost, you know, so and so? Well, with these extra building costs, can they write those in, or are they stuck trying to eat it somehow? It depends on the company and depends on uh, the general contractor. Some have uh, managed to write in uh, flexible language. Uh, others have locked in, uh, you know, were forced to lock in on bids. So maybe they inflated at the beginning and they're going to eat the rest. But yeah, it's a big concern in the industry. Um, especially for smaller companies who maybe don't have as sophisticated a uh, bidding process um, as others. Um, yeah, everyone is uh, everyone's limping along trying to struggle through this. Um, you know, <laughs> this, these stats don't even include some of the other costs that have skyrocketed just in the last two months, which are things like paint and adhesive coatings and whatnot. 
um, which have, have shot up thanks to some uh, chemical issues down in the States. Yeah, can you explain what's going on with paint, if you can find it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, paint's going up in, in price, and it's becoming harder to find uh, big quantities of it. It's not because the big um, paint suppliers don't want to sell to you. They would love to sell to you, but they can't get it either. What happened was, uh, you know, there was major damage in Texas, where there's a number of chemical plants uh, uh, that produce a huge percentage of the world's, or at least North America's, paint supply. Um, you know, there were the blackouts, the freezing storms. That set them back uh, several months. And, yeah, um, it's getting harder and harder to, to secure the paint that you need to, uh, to finish buildings off. So companies are having, me, having to be creative and beg and borrow and whatever they can to get paint out of the uh, suppliers who would, I'm sure, love to be able to sell, especially at the price it's getting right now, but they just don't have it. The Conference Board of Canada had a two-year outlook for British Columbia. What did that report say? Well, you know, a, a few different things. Um, essentially, the recovery is beginning to slow a little bit. Um, you know, it shot up uh, pretty quickly and now is sort of not leveling out, still climbing slowly. Uh, they think GDP will grow by about 6% in 2021, which would be an incredibly, you know, uh, amazing year if we hadn't had the massive, you know, 5.5% drop the year before. So, um, yeah, there, there's some hope there. Um, they're very concerned still uh, about tourism, uh, even though now, uh, uh, July 1st, uh, they're going to open uh, tourism up uh, nationally. Um, we're still not getting international travelers coming in, still not getting cruise ships, things like that. So that's a big concern. Um, the hotels, restaurants, they took a big hit out of that. And, you know, they don't expect uh, hotels and restaurants to get back to their pre-pandemic level until 2022 and probably late in that year, um, probably in the summer of that year. So, yeah, it's, there's a lot still to be done in order to get the economy back up and running here in British Columbia. We'll have more with Jordan Bateman right after this. Engineer Gold Mines is focused on the exploration and development of the historic high-grade Engineer Gold Mine situated 32 kilometers southwest of Atlan, British Columbia. Engineer Gold Mines is fully permitted for surface and underground exploration with the drill program now underway. Engineer Gold Mines Limited trades on the TSX Venture Exchange, symbol EAU. For more information, please visit us at engineergoldmines.com. Don't miss out. Stay informed. Receive the HowStreet.com weekly recap with thought-provoking podcasts, radio, and articles delivered to your inbox. Sign up for the HowStreet.com weekly recap on our homepage at HowStreet.com. Welcome back. We're speaking with Jordan Bateman. Jordan, are you still looking for people in various trades? Oh, always. Yes, absolutely. If you want a job in construction, you can have it. Uh, as we record this, it's Wednesday. We can have you out on site by Monday um, learning the trade and working. Um, there's a huge shortage of labor. You know, we talked about the supply shortage and supply costs going up. Labor costs are also going up. It's not unique to construction. Uh, virtually every uh, industry across Canada, uh, because of you know, uh, we're going over a bit of a demographic cliff here with an aging workforce, um, there's big competition for workers, especially young ones. But yeah, if, if you want a job in construction, we can definitely put you to work. icba.ca slash jobs. You can upload your resume and we'll be in touch very quickly. Why is it that uh, BC's having a, a shortage of construction trades? Is it a lack of uh, people who want to get into it? Maybe they're not aware of their careers? Or, you know, is the government providing enough training spaces? Well, training spaces are the significant roadblock um, to getting Red Seal trained um, journey people. Uh, you know, it's hard to explain to folks, like, you know, apprenticeships it should be a four-year program. Um, you know, you work at a company and you're doing, you know, your, your kind of apprenticeship work on the side or on off hours. The truth is, though, the way the system's been set up has not worked that way. And for a lot of people, a lot of trades, there's maybe one school in all of British Columbia where you can actually go. Um, they'll often force you to take time off work to do it because they have no competition, so they're not looking for flexible models of, of delivering training. But, you know, if you're a concrete finisher, you know, a floor covering installer, a bricklayer, um, if you're uh, in refrigeration and air conditioning, which 
Uh, God bless you this week. You're making a fortune. If you're in glazing, uh, paint or decorator, there's only one school for each of those in all of BC. So if you live in Paris or Prince George or uh, Victoria, you know, you have to generally come to the lower mainland, put your career on hold and, and go and do the, your apprenticeship. And it's made worse. There's huge wait lists. So apprentices, applicants will often wait, you know, at least two years, sometimes more to get in. And, you know, it drags out an apprenticeship pro- process from maybe, you know, what could be done in four years to as much as a decade because you're trying to balance all these other different things that you're trying to, uh, you know, your career, you're trying to balance your family life and you're trying to make sure that all these things work. So it is um, a huge failing by the BC government not to have more um, uh, training schools going. We should be finding as many adaptable, uh, innovative models as possible to get uh, to get people into the trades. If someone was interested in working in construction, where can they go? icba.ca slash jobs. Uh, you can upload your resume there. And there's also uh, information on apprenticeships and things like that um, to help you. How did the construction business deal with the massive heat dome over B.C.? 40 degree plus temperatures in the interior, 50. So we're looking at 104, 120 degrees Fahrenheit. Well, companies dealt with it in a number of different ways. Um, some shut down their sites. I think when school was canceled on that Monday uh, in the Lower Mainland, there was a lot of um, a number of companies that just canceled work. Um, uh, you know, I noticed that we're driving into our office, construction sites that had been humming with activity last week were uh, virtually empty this week. Um, so that, that that's one piece of it. Um, some, you know, tried to work through it, um, you know, using things like ice packs and hard hats and uh, all sorts of other uh, little tricks to try to stay cool. Um, but generally, um, you know, lots of water, lots of hydration, lots of Gatorade on sites, trying to make sure that people are uh, staying as uh, as hydrated as they can. And if uh, there's overheating, getting them into a, a little cool, a cooled area, um, that was helpful too. I, I can tell you anecdotally, this isn't to do with construction, but you know, our office is at uh, Metrotown Mall. And uh, Metrotown on Monday was as busy as it is at Christmas time. It was packed with people looking for some air conditioning relief from the heat. Um, not not all of them shopping. Many of them just, you know, sitting, actually sitting on the floors of the mall, um, especially on the bottom floor, which was even cooler than the top one. Um, you know, drinking uh, their McDonald's dollar day drinks, I guess, and, and just kind of kicking back and relaxing and trying to beat the heat. So... Um, yeah, Christmas levels of uh, customers here at Metrotown on, on Monday, uh, which was sort of an amazing thing to see. Yeah, Burnaby RCMP had to be called to a Canadian tire because fist fights were breaking out over the few available fans and air conditioners. Yeah, that doesn't, I mean, that disappoints me. It doesn't surprise me. It was a desperate situation for a lot of people. And, you know, even, you know, our office, um, Obviously, with COVID protocols, we're very careful about, you know, and some of our folks have been working from home very regularly. Almost everyone was in on Monday, <laughs> you know, because it's a little bit, air, you know, it's got the air conditioning going, and um, it was, you know, just a way to keep cool. So, uh, yeah, it's, uh, never seen anything like that. Um, I do have concerns, Jim, like, on the Friday night before the big heat boom, um, in our neighborhood, we live in, in Walnut Grove in Langley, you know, a suburban neighborhood built in the 90s and early 2000s. Um, our power infrastructure could not keep up with all the air conditioners that were going, uh, the fans, the electric vehicles that were charging. Uh, you know, I noticed that Prime Minister Trudeau has announced that by 2035, no more fuel, uh, gas-powered vehicles will be sold. They all have to be electric. Uh, I have big concerns that our electrical you know, electricity generation system and transmission systems are not up to the kind of challenge of that because when you're blowing a transformer on a 40 degree or a 38 degree night um, in July, um, even before you add another, you know, 100 or 1,000 or whatever electric vehicles to the mix, um, that is problematic. So very curious to see, okay, well, that's great that you want to do electric vehicles. What's your plan to actually upgrade the uh the generation and transmission. Sure, we saw in California with the heat wave, people were told not to charge their electric cars so much for getting to work. Yeah, well, exactly. And then that gets very dangerous. And, you know, it, as well, not to mention, like, those cars often are a piece of relief. If you don't have air conditioning in your house or your apartment or townhouse, you know, 
you'll often go for a little drive in your car that night and try to cool yourself down when you're overheating. Um, you know, I saw pictures on Instagram of people working in their cars, uh, idling and, and uh, enjoying the air conditioning and, you know, cats and dogs in the back seat while they're answering emails. So, yeah, you, you need that infrastructure. And, you know, it's I worry sometimes about the lack of systems thinking within government where you bring down these mandates like, we're going to end natural gas in Vancouver. We only want electric vehicles after such and such a date. But you're not actually building up the infrastructure to supply that. You're only looking at, you know, the end product and instead of working your way back and going, oh, geez, you know, we're going to need so many more kilowatts. We're going to need, uh, you know, transmission systems that can handle it. We're going to have to upgrade every single neighborhood in British Columbia in order to handle the electrical loads. Um, you know, we need to do a better, government needs to do a better job of thinking ahead on these things. Well, one electric car, I think it's 185 kilos, 300 pounds of copper wire alone per car. Where are we going to get that copper? And if we're going to improve the electrical grid, where's that copper going to come from? And what's that going to cost? Well, that's a great point, especially at a time where we're harder than ever on mining. Um, you know, more regulation, more red tape, more approvals, more environmental protests against mining than ever before. Um, so there's that piece of it. Um, yeah, you know, you're exactly right. The raw materials don't magically appear. Um, you've got to figure out a way to, to handle this. And look, you know, some people say, oh, solar panels are the answer. Okay, well, solar panels can help at certain times of day, the day or year, but not, you know, fully. Um, there's a lot that has to be done. We, look, look at the fight we've had over Site C, you know. That's a, a dam that, you know, has been heavily protested. Um, you know, is more than double in cost because, frankly, of, mismanagement by the NDP government and some of the challenges around uh, the way they slowed that process down artificially. Um, you know, this is a big problem for British Columbia. Like, where are we going to get the power? Where are we going to get the raw materials? And how do we actually, you know, even if we can generate it, how do we actually get it into, you know, New Westminster, Queensboro, Walnut Grove, all of these neighborhoods across uh, British Columbia that are going to need it? And one thing that I see totally ignored in BC, apart from a barge that was made to generate power for a fishing lodge, is that no one pays attention to all this uh, copious tidal power we have because of Vancouver Island being in the way. The tides all along the BC coast are spaced apart and, and probably could generate power continuously. Any thoughts on, on developing that? Well, again, you come up see to more narrows. Video. You know, where you yeah. have some of the biggest yeah. tides in the world. I mean, you, you come up to this over and over again, though. Like, okay, that's great. Like, that's a very logical solution to this problem. I don't think it's terribly invasive. But you just know, like, you, you touch anything in the ocean and people freak out. Um, you know, you add a tanker a, a, tanker a day to, for, from the Trans Mountain. And, uh, you know, people are, you know, certain that that means the extinction of the orcas. So, you know, what does it mean if you have, you know, uh, these power plants? I, I also think back to when Gordon Campbell brought in the independent power producing project. And look, there were some flaws with that project for sure. Um, but that was heavily skewed to indigenous projects and to run of river projects. And many of those were hugely controversial. And, you know, the program eventually had to be scaled back. So, um, you know, it, it bothers me that, you know, the same people who are out there protesting against oil and gas and, you know, want, you know, things like electric vehicles and people that have big lifestyle changes don't actually have a solution for how to generate enough electricity and get it transmitted uh, to, to meet the uh, demands that would be uh, incurred. Well, hopefully uh, they get a handle on it soon because there's nothing like uh, a million more electric cars plugging in and finding out there's nothing on the other side of the plug. Yeah, like, you know, they're still talking about, the electric vehicle announcement was instructive because they're still talking about how they're going to, you know, continue to offer rebates to, you know, get Canadians to buy into electric vehicles. I don't actually think rebates, you know, matter as much. Like I think, you know, cost savings like gas makes the case pretty compellingly to go for an electric vehicle if you can, if if you're lucky enough to be able to afford it. But, you know, they should be taking that money and probably billions more and putting it into electrical generation because that is where the pinch point is going to be. And if people start to sense that there isn't enough power to actually supply the vehicles that the government's demanding them to buy, that policy will fall by the wayside very quickly. Jordan, have a great Canada Day. Thanks for having me, Jim. 
My guest has been Jordan Bateman, Vice President of Communications and Marketing for the Independent Contractors and Business Association in British Columbia. His website, icba.ca. If you have any questions for Jordan or any of our other guests, you can send them to info at howstreet.com. Find us on Twitter at TalkDigitalNet. We're also on the TalkDigitalNetwork.com and Facebook. I'm Jim Goddard. Thank you for listening. Comments made on the Goddard Report and TalkDigitalNetwork.com are an expression of opinion only. The Goddard Report is available online and mobile at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. The Goddard Report is a production of How Street Media Incorporated.